I think that it's incumbent upon us to look closely at what's happening within the prison system in this country because it's a microcosm of what our corporate masters are planning for the rest of us. Because that is a place at which there is no impediment for corporate abuse. That is like those sacrifice zones that Joe and I wrote about in Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, where once there's no impediment to corporate power, the environment is destroyed, families are destroyed. I mean, you go to southern West Virginia where they're blowing the tops 400 feet off the mountains, giant toxic impoundment ponds. Um, we would go into elementary schools in the nurse's office and there's rows of little inhalers because none of those kids can breathe. We went into hollas in southern West Virginia where everybody had had their gallbladders removed from all of the toxins that come through the sludge that is pumped into their showers and their kitchens and everything else. Um, that's what happened. And now we've all become a sacrifice zone. You watch, I wrote a column, which you should pull up, called The Prison State of America, but it's about all the corporations. It details all the ways they make money. So now when you go into prison, you don't get shoes. Remember, these people earn $1.30 a day for eight hours of work. And they don't get shoes. So they're earning $28 a month. Shoes, a pair of Nike and, Nikes in prison cost $45. Commissary prices, I got a list of, now it's in this article, commissary prices in 1996, I compared them with commissary prices today, they've gone up by 100%, but salaries have remained the same. So you have charge after charge. If you have a member of your immediate family who is either dying or dead, you can get a 15 minute visit, visit them either in the hospital or at the viewing and they charge you $800. Actually, it can be over $900 for the guards. So you slap these fees on these people, and they have no income. So now we're watching people, if they ever get out of the prison system, they're in debt to thousands of dollars. And they can't get work, they're locked out of housing, they can't get food stamps, and if they can't meet their debt obligation that they incurred working eight hours a day in prison, they're back in prison. Go on Corrections Corp of America's website. It's a, the largest for-profit prison in the country. And they say on there, we're a really good business because America has a 64% recidivism rate, i.e., don't worry, all, most of those who get out are going right back in. And that's where we're headed, which I will end, brings me to my last book, uh, Wages of Rebellion. And it asks the question is how, in a species of totalitarianism, the corporate totalitarianism, the inverted totalitarianism that we live under, how do you revolt? And I spend a lot of time talking to people who have revolted. Julian Assange, who I saw in the embassy in Ecuador several times, Mumia Abu Jamal, Jeremy Hammond, and others. Uh, because I want people to understand when you seriously revolt what the state does to you. And I think it's the, uh, it has to begin to be the understanding that revolt itself is a moral imperative. That asking the question as to whether it can succeed is the wrong question. Revolt is not finally about what we achieve. But revolt is about what we become. I don't fight fascists because finally I believe that I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. And these fascists have us by the throat and they have my children by the throat. And if nothing else, especially those of us who come from the older generation, we are allowing these forces to rob our young of their future. So that even if we fail, and I speak as a father, 
I want my children to be able to say he tried. So the question is not, finally, whether we can succeed. I don't like going to jail. Going to jail is more time than I care to donate to the US government. But I think that in those acts of defiance, in the rebuilding of mass radical movements that have been consciously destroyed, in the understanding that it's not our job to achieve power. That's the wrong question. You know, Karl Popper in The Open Society and Its Enemies says precisely that. Most people, he says, attracted to power are at best mediocre, which is Obama or Venal, which is Bush. The question, Popper says, is not how do you get good people to rule, but how do you make those in power frightened of you? So there's a scene in Kissinger's memoirs, um, don't buy the book, where uh, Kissinger and Nixon, I think it's 71, are sitting in the White House. There's a huge anti-war demonstration, and Nixon has taken empty city buses end-to-end -end in a kind of wagon train all around the White House. And Nixon's wringing his hands going, Henry, Henry, they're going to break through the barricades and get us. And that's precisely where we want people in power to be. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris Edges. Folks, we have uh, an opportunity here for a little bit of a question and answer period. I would, uh, I've got a microphone that I can kind of bring your direction. I would ask that you make your question uh, succinct, not a, not a long diatribe, but a specific question. And we can probably take them for uh, 10 or 15 minutes here. So, all right, over this way. If it makes it faster, you can, you can come down too. Uh, Mr. Hedges, thank you so much for coming to Little Olympia, Thurston County. Um, but my question is, you mentioned at the beginning you were going to say something about Occupy. Will you talk about sure. Occupy, please? Um, the Occupy movement was an extremely important moment in this process of rebellion because it was primarily driven by what Bakunin called day class A intellectuals, i.e. the children, sons and daughters of the middle class, who were often college educated, had tremendous loans, and uh, walked out into the wider society and found that there was no place for them. And that group of day, that was by the way the big battle between Marx and Bakunin. Marx dismissed the importance of day class A intellectuals, and Bakunin said they were absolutely vital to any successful revolt. And I think Bakunin was right. Um, it experienced for the first time what people in marginal communities, especially people of color, have been experiencing for decades. Unemployment, police abuse, um, eviction, hopelessness, uh, and I think that that is emblematic of the failure on the part of the traditional liberal elite. I think that the, the kind of um, boutique activism of the liberal class, which got too involved in gender politics and identity politics and multiculturalism, all of which I support, but forgot about the fundamental issue of justice. So while the working class was being destroyed, um, they busied themselves on inclusiveness, which is, of course, is important, but not at the expense of justice. And so there was a kind of skepticism of the Occupy movement by many in marginal communities because they said, well, where were you? And that's a fair question. Um, now, the Occupy movement was a, a mainstream movement in the sense that I believe it articulated the demands of the mainstream. And here's the Occupy movement is a perfect example of how 
the corporate state is not rational. So a rational response to the Occupy movement would have been a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions, a massive jobs program, especially targeted people under the age of 25, a rational healthcare system instead of this corporate monstrosity that's being shoved down our throat, i.e. the public option for everyone. Um, and the state responded by physically eradicating the Occupy encampments, which was very short-sighted. And remember, it was all coordinated by the Obama White House. Because this was a nonviolent movement. Some of you may know my entanglements with the black bloc, but this was a mainstream nonviolent movement. And I believe that what terrified the state, I mean, especially if you were in Zuccotti on the weekends, you had all these parents with strollers pushing their kids from New Jersey, you know, that terrified the state. Uh, and you saw the classic attempt on figures like Van Jones, part of the Democratic establishment, to co-opt the Occupy movement and funnel the energy back into a dead political system. But finally, I think we have to look at the Occupy movement as a tactic in the same way that the Freedom Rides in the old Civil Rights Movement were a tactic. So the Freedom Rides, someone correct me if I'm wrong, at 54, 55, you have the sit down at the lunch counters around 61. Something's coming. I mean, I covered all, most of the revolutions in Eastern Europe. I covered East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and um, nobody can predict. I know the tinder's there, but nobody can predict what will ignite it. So on November 9th, 1989, I was in Leipzig with the leaders of the East German opposition. And I remember them saying to me, this was in the afternoon, maybe within a year there will be free passage back and forth across the Berlin Wall. By that evening, the Berlin Wall, at least as an impediment to human traffic, did not exist. Even the leaders themselves didn't know. Once these movements take off, they have a kind of centrifugal force. And I think we have to look at Greece, because throughout history, revolutionary movements come in waves. If, after this four-month agreement, the Greeks walk away from the euro, and it's not ultimately sustainable, 175% uh, de debt for Greece is 175% of GDP. It's not a sustainable. If they walk away and survive, and of course the international banking community will do just what they did to Allende, to, I mean there will be bread lines and gas shortages and power outages, they will use every mechanism in their power to destroy an independent Greece. But if it survives, you have Podemos, which is running for elections in Spain in December, uh, and you have powerful movements in Ireland, in Italy, in Portugal, um, and at that point, the system could break down. You know, so when, when all of this happens, it happens at such a pace by which even the leaders of the movement kind of, it takes on a kind of life of its own. Uh, and I think the uh, Occupy is emblematic of this cauldron of dissent. So what comes next may not be called Occupy. It may not look like Occupy. And I think Black Lives Matter is part of this, you know, it is kind of hereditary to this movement, um, but that something is coming, I have no doubt. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hedges, thank you for demonstrating what I believe is uh, true patriotism. Um, we have an organization in our state called WA MEND, W-A, the abbreviation for Washington, MEND, and they mirror what's going on in many states around the country um, effort to overturn the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United and other decisions which essentially created out of whole cloth, out of thin air, the concept of corporate personhood, which allows corporations basically to buy elections in more right. than one way, campaign donations right. and others. I've heard it said amongst those people, 17 states, by the way, have approved uh, either an initiative or a law demanding that Congress proffer an amendment that says a corporation is not a person, money is not free speech. I've heard people say that when it gets to 37, 38, 39, 40 states, if we can do that, 
and Congress refuses to act, that this will really uh, set the American people on fire politically. Um, could you co comment on the movement around the country I to think, overturn citizens' I think citizens that posits that the system is redeemable. And I think, um, boy, just watch um, the U.S. Congress on their knees, well, on their feet before Bibi Netanyahu or all 100 senators passing a resolution why Israel is carrying out absolutely egregious war crimes using attack aircraft to bomb a po civilian population that has no army, no navy, no air force, uh, no command and control center, no mechanized units, and calling it Israeli self-defense. Um, I mean, money has replaced the vote. And, and those who now uh, are sitting both in state and national legislatures are corporate employees. Um, and um, they are not going to turn on their patrons. Uh, I think, and I, this is what I spent all morning talking to Kashama about, uh, and, and we, what we've been discussing. I think we have to begin to create a movement or a party um, like Ceresa in Greece. Remember, Ceresa 10 years ago only polled 4%. Ceresa now has an approval rating in Greece of 70%. Podemos could very well win the election in Spain. And I think that we have to create our own entity. And as Kashama was saying this morning, the ironclad rule is that we will not take one cent of corporate money, not a penny. That is absolutely a non-negotiable demand. Uh, and I think that we have to recreate the movements that created democracy in America with the understanding that it's not our job to take power, it's our job to scare the shit out of people in power. That's our job. Um, and we can do that if we hold fast to those moral imperatives. You could argue that in 1968, the most powerful political figure in this country was Martin Luther King. Because when he went to Selma or Memphis, 50,000 people went with him. That's what we have to recreate. We have to, I, I do in that sense buy the anarchist notion that power is the problem. I don't agree with John Holloway and other anarchists that you can exercise power by not taking power. Um, and it's those mass movements that keep power, even sympathetic power, in check. And we have to rebuild those movements. So this is what we were discussing this morning, because we want to be ready. You don't if things begin to crumble, they're getting ready, and we want to be ready. Um, and if things go down and there is unrest, and they're certainly preparing for it, I think one of the reasons they passed the National Defense Authorization Act is because they finally don't trust the police to protect them. And there's some indication, if you remember the Chicago teachers' strike, when they were, every time they'd go in precincts to use the bathroom or something, they'd be applauded by the Chicago police. Or when we, uh, did an action with Veterans for Peace in front of the White House. 133 of us got arrested on the White House fence um, when we were being cuffed. It turns out that most of the D.C. police are in the National Guard and had been in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they were cuffing us saying, keep protesting these wars because they stink. Now, the ruling class has to understand that this sentiment is running through the foot soldiers who maintain control. But we have to have a political vision, which in my case has to be socialist, a political vision um, and a party that remains outside of the control of corporate power, along with those mass movements in order to be effective. But we are entering a moment of crisis when we've been utterly disarmed. And those forces, retrograde forces on the right are very powerful. Because vigilante violence and American fascism is very real. I mean, as um, the Klan is, Ku Klux Klan, which controlled whole states, including Indiana, is kind of the pure expression of American fascism. Uh, and you see it with the Tea Party and the lunatic fringe of the Republican Party. I mean, I do have to hand it to Clinton in this, in that basically Clinton made the Democratic Party into the Republican Party, and he pushed the Republican Party so far to the right they became insane. Okay, so there was a kind of logic to it. Um, the, we have to create 
mechanisms to defend ourselves because you have the Koch brothers and under you know, the Tea Parties, the militias, and these are proto-fascist movements. You they, proto fascist or fascist movements channel a very legitimate rage. The rage is legitimate. But instead of directing it towards the centers of power, it directs it at the vulnerable. Undocumented workers, Muslims, homosexuals, feminists, intellectuals, you know, they have a long list of people they hate. Um, and that is a strong undercurrent in the, in the American culture. I mean, we are a very, very violent culture. And it may, if we're not prepared, that backlash, and there will be a backlash, could be a right-wing backlash that calls for a more, author, more overtly authoritarian structure. But I don't think that, you know, I know Lawrence Lessig has raised $12 million to do super PACs, which failed miserably. You know, as if we can, we, on the level of money, we can't compete. And it doesn't matter what we want. Obama in 2008, you know, he made dozens of promises, including revisiting NAFTA and closing Guantanamo and not doing torture and wholesale service. I mean, none of which he kept. Because you don't get power in this country unless you serve the interests of the Imperium, Wall Street, and the internal security and surveillance apparatus. Otherwise, you don't have power. Um, hi. Um, I'm a school teacher, and I wanted to let everyone know, and Mr. Hedges, you may already know this, but the corporations are gunning for our public schools mm -hmm. right now, and they're doing it through the guise of this high-stakes testing. Right. The corporations, namely the Gates Foundation, the Walmart Foundation, Pearson Publishing, and who else is in there? Oh, all the banks like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, they're trying to close down our public schools. And the way that they do it is they create these tests that 60 to 70 percent of kids are destined to fail. So they create it using the hardest questions. This is going to be um, our way to change this system because they're going after our children right now. Well, that's, so, yeah, that's right. And charter schools. And are so key. what they do is, in Rahm Emanuel, close down a hundred right. public schools, and they turn them into charter for profit schools, and the banks are behind the schools. So I was wondering if you could speak to this, and if I could plug my website. It's called WeaponsOfMassDeception.org. I'm one of these really wild, riled up types of people. I might not look at like it. But we are having hundreds and thousands of parents in the Puget Sound area waking up. We have schools refusing to give the test. Students are walking out of the test in Colorado, New Mexico, Seattle. We are not going to be putting up with this because the kids know the corporations have no right to call me a failure and to call me not ready for college and career based on a stupid test. Pearson makes $2.1 billion a year. I hope all of you can look into this. My website, again, is weaponsofmassdeception.org. We must stand united against the corporate take over about public schools. Well, that's right. And um, I mean, corporate, I mean, anytime hedge fund managers become intensely interested in the plight of inner city schools, it's not because they want to teach people to read. It's because they know the US government sends, spends about $600 billion in education, and they want it. Um, and what they're doing is creating a system of education that's purely vocational, because as you know, as a teacher, teaching people how to think and teaching people what to think are very different enterprises. And what they want is a rote kind of learning. Because let's face it, the liberal arts, by their nature, let's go back to Plato, are subversive. You are taught, if you are trained in liberal arts, to question assumptions and structures and power, to ask questions that are uncomfortable to those who hold power. And that's why there has been such a fierce war against the liberal arts and the turning of even major research universities into uh, highly specialized vocational schools. And I speak of my own school, Harvard, uh, which is quickly trying to emulate Stanford so that uh, you have a situation where the humanities are pushed to the margins. And then once you get to state schools, uh, you have whole departments that must raise all their own money, not only uh, for their research money, but often for their salaries. Well, if you're teaching classics, um, who's going to fund you? If you're teaching philosophy, you know, all of those disciplines that deal with the possibility of transformation, 
because the goal is to create systems managers, people who don't question the system but seek only to serve it. And that's what schools like now, I've taught at Princeton, people like at schools like Princeton and Harvard do. They turn out systems managers. Harvard was a couple years ago, 49% of its graduating class was going into financial services, but that didn't count all the people who went to law school and became corporate lawyers. What about our teachers? What about our doctors? What about you know, all of these professions that make a civil society possible? And the elite institutions, I mean, one of the things that kind of cracks me up about Obama, you know, he's here, you know, we have to be more educated to be compete on the world level. No, 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 the people who got us into this mess were the best educated. Larry Summers, and they all went to all of these elite schools. The problem isn't education, the problem is greed. And I'm, I'm with you and I'm terrified. I mean, my, my son just finished a graduate degree in French literature at Columbia, but when he went to college, I said, if you take anything anybody tells you as practical, you've just wasted my money. <laughs> the point is to learn how to think. Because if you don't learn how to think, you're a drone, which is just what they're trying to create. And it's drones on various levels. So if you're an inner city school, they'll give you enough literacy to stand behind the counter at a Burger King. And if you're at Princeton, you're still a drone. They're just giving you the technical skills to go to Goldman Sachs and, you know, let's got even get started on Goldman Sachs. I was arrested in front of Goldman Sachs. But Cornell West and I held a people's hearings of Goldman Sachs <coughs> in Zuccotti Park. And um, we brought uh, single mothers who'd been evicted from their homes and school teachers who had lost their jobs and then it's kind of funny. I gave up a long time ago trying to look hip. So there's a, actually a picture of about 300 protesters. Uh, all of us are walking towards Goldman Sachs and we block the entrance of Goldman Sachs. And everybody around me is like pierced and tattooed and mohawked. And I have a button down Brooks Brothers shirt and a little tweed jacket. Um, but we got to the, we blocked the entrance of Goldman Sachs. Anybody have a copy of Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt? Do you? Can you, you with you? Oh, okay, I was gonna, oh. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna read this little section to you since you brought it up. So this is, this is Goldman Sachs. One of the most evil corporations in human history. And I'll close with this. Faces appeared to me. Moments before protesters from Occupy Wall Street and I were arrested on a windy November afternoon in front of Goldman Sachs. They were not the faces of the smug Goldman Sachs employees who peered at us through the revolving glass doors and lobby windows. They were not the faces of the blue uniform police with their dangling plastic handcuffs or the thuggish Goldman Sachs security personnel whose buzz cuts and dead eyes reminded me of the Stasi. They were not the faces of the demonstrators around me the ones with massive student debts and no jobs, the ones weighed down by their broken dreams, the ones whose anger and betrayal triggered the street demonstrations and occupations for justice. They were not the faces of the onlookers, the construction workers who seemed cheered by the march on Goldman Sachs or the suited businessmen who did not. They were far away faces. They were the faces of children dying. They were tiny, confused, bewildered faces I had seen in the southern Sudan, Gaza, the slums of Brazzaville, Nairobi, 
Cairo, Delhi, and the wars I covered. They were faces with large, glassy eyes above bloated bellies. They were the small faces of children convulsed by the ravages of starvation and disease. I carry these faces. They do not leave me. I look at my own children and cannot forget them, these other children who never had a chance. War brings with it a host of horrors, but the worst is always the human detritus that war and famine leave behind. The small, frail bodies whose tangled limbs and vacant eyes condemn us all. The wealthy and the powerful, the ones behind the glass at Goldman Sachs laughed and snapped pictures of us as if we were an odd lunchtime diversion from commodities trading, from hoarding and profit, from the collective sickness of money worship, as if we were creatures in a cage, which in fact we soon were. Goldman Sachs Commodities Index is the most heavily traded in the world. The financial firm hoards futures of rice, wheat, corn, sugar, and livestock, and jacks up commodity prices by as much as 200% on the global market so that poor families can no longer afford basic staples and literally starve. Hundreds of millions of poor in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America do not have enough to eat in order to feed this mania for profit. The technical jargon learned in business schools and on trading floors effectively masks the reality of what is happening. Murder. The cold, neutral words of business and commerce are designed to make systems operate, even systems of death, with a ruthless efficiency. The people behind the windows and those of us with arms locked in a circle on the concrete outside did not speak the same language. Profit, trade, speculation, globalization, war, national security. These are the words they use to justify the snuffing out of tiny lives, acts of radical evil. The glass tower before us is filled with people carefully selected for the polish and self-assurance that comes with having been formed in institutions of privilege. Their primary attributes are a lack of consciousness, a penchant for deception, aggressiveness, a worship of money, and an incapacity for empathy or remorse. And it is always the respectable classes, the polished Ivy League graduates, the prep school boys and girls who grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, or Short Hills, New Jersey, who are the most susceptible to evil. To be intelligent, as many are, at least in a narrow analytical way, is morally neutral. These respectable citizens are inculcated in their elitist ghettos with values and norms, including pious acts of charity used to justify their privilege, and a belief in the innate goodness of American power. They are trained to pay deference to systems of authority. They are taught to believe in their own goodness, unable to see or comprehend, and are perhaps indifferent to the cruelty inflicted on others by the exclusive systems they serve. And as norms change, as the world is steadily transformed by corporate forces into a small cobble of predators and a vast herd of human prey, these elites seamlessly replace one set of values with another. These elites obey the rules, they make the system work, and they are rewarded for this. In return, they do not question. We seem to have lost 
at least until the advent of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Not only all personal responsibility, but all capacity for personal judgment. Corporate culture absolves all of responsibility. This is part of its appeal. It relieves all from moral choice. There is an unequivocal acceptance of principles such as unregulated capitalism and globalization as a kind of natural law. The steady march of corporate capitalism requires a passive acceptance of new laws and demolished regulations of bailouts in the trillions of dollars and the systematic looting of public funds of lies and deceit. The corporate culture epitomized by Goldman Sachs has seeped into our classrooms, our newsrooms, our entertainment systems, and our consciousness. This corporate culture has stripped us of the right to express ourselves outside of the narrow confines of the established political order. We are forced to surrender our voice. Corporate culture serves a faceless system. It is, as Hannah Arendt wrote, the rule of nobody. And for this very reason, perhaps the least human and most cruel form of rulership. Those who resist, the doubters, outcasts, artists, renegades, skeptics, and rebels rarely come from the elite. They ask different questions. They seek something else, a life of meaning. They have grasped Immanuel Kant's dictum, if justice perishes, human life on earth has lost its meaning. And in their search, they come to the conclusion that as Socrates said, it is better to suffer wrong than do wrong. This conclusion makes a leap into the moral. It refuses to place a monetary value on human life. It acknowledges human life, indeed all life, is sacred. And this is why, as Arendt points out, the only morally reliable people are not those who say, this is wrong, or this should not be done, but those who say, I can't. The greatest evildoers are those who don't remember because they have never given thought to the matter. And without remembrance, nothing can hold them back, Arendt wrote. For human beings, thinking of past matters means moving in the dimension of depth, striking roots and thus stabilizing ourselves so as not to be swept away by whatever may occur, the zeitgeist or history or simple temptation. The greatest evil is not radical, it has no roots, and because it has no roots, it has no limitations, it can go to unthinkable extremes and sweep over the whole world. There are streaks in my lungs, traces of the tuberculosis I picked up around hundreds of dying Sudanese during the famine I covered as a foreign correspondent. I was strong and privileged and fought off the disease. They were not and did not. The bodies, most of them children, were dumped into hastily dug mass graves. The scars I carry within me are the whispers of these dead. They are the faint marks of those who never had a chance to become men or women, to fall in love and have children of their own. I carried these scars to the doors of Goldman Sachs. I placed myself at the feet of these commodity traders to call for justice because the dead and those dying in slums and refugee camps across the planet could not make the journey. I see their faces. They haunt me in the day and they come to me in the dark. They force me to remember and they make me choose sides. Thank you. We have some
powerful enemies here that we're facing. You know, it's not. I know that Shelma is a very popular uh, candidate. She has the highest popularity of all the city council members. But it's not. You know, with this super PAC forming, we need to make sure that we um, organize a serious struggle to win this campaign. But we can win this campaign. We absolutely can win it. But it's going to require a serious fundraising effort and a serious grassroots mobilization. So it's really great that all of you are here today. Um, and when we call on you to, to go out and knock on doors, to distribute newsletters, I want you to ask yourself if you are tired of real estate developers taking over our city and driving our rents up. Look what they've done to South Lake Union, for example. Do you want the rest of Seattle just to be transformed with these giant glossy buildings and real estate condos with no say from the local residents? Um, Seattle has the fastest rising rent of any city in the nation. I want you should ask yourself, do you do you believe that the the workers who make this city run, you know, the the, the, the construction workers, the nurses, the teachers, the the bus drivers, um, the bartenders, the musicians, shouldn't they have a right to live in the city that they work in? Just one example is recently Vulcan, which is the uh, this real estate development corporation. They've given over $25,000 to elected officials in City Hall, except for Shoma Solomon, of course, who doesn't accept corporate cash. And just recently, they got a $500,000 tax break from the City Council and the Mayor. That's the kind of stuff that goes on in our City Hall. If you're tired of corporations uh, running our government, running our city, if you're tired of rent going up, then you, we need your help to fight for rent control. Uh, inequality is out of control, and we need rent control, and it's time to do something. Now, we definitely have powerful enemies uh, stacked against us. But remember, a couple years ago, people thought it was crazy that we could raise Seattle's minimum wage to the highest in the nation. They thought it was crazy that we could get a candidate elected without corporate cash, you know, especially the socialists. But we did it. We absolutely did it. And so uh, we can get Shama elected, but it, it's, 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 it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a fight. And you know, there's a lot of corporate money stacked against us, but we have the benefit of the people potentially supporting us, but we need to make sure that they actually vote. We, we really need your help to get out the vote and to talk to people to explain these issues to them. That's going to be absolutely central. Um, in 2003, the political establishment didn't realize how effective Shama Sawant is and her socialist alternative party, but now they are aware of that, and they are prepared to fight back. And they are, they are they're preparing attacks, and they have already started attacking and we're expecting uh, serious attacks against Shama's re-election campaign. I would be shocked if there were not mailers sent out to every uh, voter in District 3, you know, criticizing Shama in one way or another, possibly even slandering Shama. Uh, we need to be ready for those attacks. When the, when the, we, need to, we need to have a strong showing in the primary uh, election campaign, which ends on August 3rd, and then we need to make sure we win in the general election campaign. Now, another thing that's going to happen is the corporate media is going to make it sound like it was Mayor Murray who brought 15 to Seattle. Now, Mayor Murray eventually did agree to 15, um, but there's no doubt that it wouldn't have happened without the fast food workers going on strike, without the voters of SeaTac passing it, and without the election of Shema Salman. It was really a movement from below, from the working class, from uh, you know 15 now activists and unions, and especially Councilmember Salman led the fight on 15. And so when we have this action, on the 28th, part of the purpose of it is to make sure people know that tr that truth that it, that the way we got this was by workers standing up and fighting for this, and ordinary people organizing and electing an independent candidate. That's what got the $15 minimum wage. You know, a lot of workers they know that there's some kind of minimum wage going up, but they may not know the details of how it goes up. Uh, it's really great news to hear that you're getting a raise. Let's let it be the Sawant volunteers. Let the workers know that they're getting their raise and let them know about their rights and so forth and, and remind them of how it got passed because because our opponents are going to try to make it sound like it was the mayor that kind of just did it on his own um, and we're glad the mayor passed it but obviously it came from pressure from from others and please join me in welcoming council member Summer. call me Shama because usually I think my political enemies call me Kashmir. <laughs> but that is not to say that this seat is of critical importance not only for Seattle but for the entire US. And I wanted to apologize for my lateness 
uh, and tell you also why I was late because in that story is embedded the impact that we've had throughout, uh, you know, starting with the labor movement, victory in CTAC, our campaign succeeding in 2013, and everything that we worked on uh, in 2014. I was late because we had an article that is coming out tomorrow that is an endorsement of our campaign by Chris Hedges. How many of you know Chris Hedges? going to appear in tomorrow's issue of Truth Day. And I mentioned that not only to apologize, but also for us to get a sense of how much impact we've had, you know, for us to have our morale really high, but also to remind us of what's at stake. What's at stake for us is not just one seat on the city council that will uh, be able to push for reforms against income inequality, but it is the, you know, the it, it, what's at stake is what the morale is going to be of people, especially young people who are looking for a real social change in this country. So if we win the election, it's going to have an absolutely electrifying effect on a lot of people and internationally already we've had a huge impact. But you know, there is a little voice that is in everybody's head because of the endless founding by corporate media that, oh, maybe there was just a flash in the pan that was, you know, we, we slipped under the radar and in reality, uh, nothing has changed in American consciousness. People aren't really looking for this kind of change and Shama Sawant is just this crazy person who is on her own. We, you know, so winning this re-election campaign is going to be a confirmation of what we all know, that people are fed up, people are angry with the way things are, not just in Seattle, but everywhere. And people are looking for a change. And undoubtedly, while you know na nationwide our, our work is enormous, this campaign is going to be the focal point for this year for the left. You know, people are going to be looking at us and saying, okay, what does this show about where America is going? And in that sense, I would ask you all and ask us all, including myself, that when, when moments are hard, and they will be hard this year, and I want to talk a little bit about that, we have to remember that there is so much that we could win if we pushed ourselves, and it is going to require us to push ourselves. Another indication of how enormous our impact has been is to see uh, how much change there has been on the question of minimum wage. I mean, last year, when the Democratic Party establishment was completely routed state in, in many states and nationally, what, what we saw was ballot initiatives, you know, voter uh, signed ballot initiatives succeeding in four different states on an increase in the minimum wage. Two of them are Republican controlled states. That, that shows us that both the party and the establishment are completely out of line with reality, out of touch with the reality that people are facing, which is, you know, what, what they want is a fight back against income inequality. We've had some exciting success, you know, uh, Rami talked about a lot of things we did. I don't know if he mentioned this other one, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, an, ex, it's an example of, what I'm going to talk about is an example of how the kind of political leadership we're fighting for is not simply, um, you know, carrying out legislation, while that is hard enough to do, when people say, oh, you know, Shama Sawant is overusing her voice, you know, she speaks to the megaphone rather than the telephone, uh, what they're really knocking is not me, but our effort at building a movement. That's what, the insult is not directed at me, it's directed at all of us on the grassroots, all of us at the bottom, all of us who have been marginalized for so long and are starting to rise up. So when you see insults like that, it should be, you know, it should be you all. We all should take it personally. You know, you're talking about us, and we're not going to let you do that. And we're going to win this campaign to prove that you're wrong. But a, a significant victory that I wanted to point out was our successful campaign against, you know, the Seattle Housing Authority yeah. in all their wisdom. When they, when they try to increase the uh, rents of low-income tenants, the most vulnerable people in our society by 400%. We fought back. And some of the people who fought back with us are right here in this room. And I wanted to highlight Abdi Muhammad, who's sitting there in the back and who looks suspiciously, suspiciously quiet. He's been a, a phenomenal organizer with the labor movement and with the community. And we, we did this by showing that political leadership is not 
passing legislation as hard as that is, but it's also using your public position to empower others who are trying to fight against injustice. And that's the voice we want to carry through. Uh, uh, Rami mentioned the Vulcan deal, you know, just two weeks ago, and this happened so quietly, nobody even hears about it. The majority of the, of the council, except for Michael Bryan and me, voted to give away a million dollars in transportation, uh, you know, giveaway to Vulcan at South Lake oh, Union. Yeah. Wow. This is happening, this is happening as we speak. And when they say Seattle is a progressive city, you know, our take on that is, yes, Seattle is an extremely progressive city, but the political establishment is out of touch with them. And they are not representing what we really want to, to, to be done. And it shows you in our, you know, in our popularity ratings, we have the highest popularity rating of any council member, but we also have the highest uh, disapproval rating. Who do you think is disapproving of what we're doing? Uh, it's, it's the Chamber of Commerce. It's the uh, business owners who, many of whom like to masquerade as struggling business owners. They are struggling business owners, but many of them privately will tell you they support our agenda because their extended families have low-wage workers and they are also struggling against a system that does not support the smallest businesses but really and you know continues to perpetuate the domination of big business and, and we our task is to draw all of them not only into our viewpoint because we know there's a latent agreement but we have to draw them into campaigning this room has to be filled to capacity and in fact we, we, we should if our campaign is going well we need to be looking for larger and larger volunteer event rooms otherwise we're we're doing something wrong we, we will be failing in our task, and we will be failing even though uh, the majority of the people in our district, majority of the people in Seattle, agree with our agenda. And a majority of the people know that working together and building coalitions means building coalitions with working people, building coalitions with community organizations that are fighting against injustice, not building coalitions with the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. So when you hear them saying that I don't build coalitions, that is what they mean, you know, always reject, reject the, uh, the face value of the argumentation and go to what they're really trying to say, which they, will, which they, which they won't say unless you, you point that out. And, and the bottom line is they're, they're, they're flinging all these attacks against us because they can't possibly in any uh, real sense claim that we didn't do what we promised to do, you know. <laughs> they can't accuse us of hypocrisy, they can't say, well, you know, she said she was going to fight for 15, and look, she she didn't do that. You know, she said she was going to represent uh, the marginalized, and she didn't do that. You know, they're resorting to these personal attacks because they are afraid not of me, but of this sweeping change that is starting to come, not just in Seattle and everywhere. And if you look at the impact of 15 now, it's incredible. We've had a big launch of 15 now in Minneapolis, and actually, one of our sisters, Uba, from here, Uba Arden, was here, was in, coincidentally in Minneapolis. And she spoke, you know, really wonderfully well about the campaign in Seattle and, and the Somali community, the East African community, the Latino community, and other working class communities have joined in the effort of 15 Now in Minneapolis. In Philadelphia, we're having so much impact that all the mayoral candidates said they support 15 because they're afraid that if they don't say it, they're not going to get the votes. This shows how, how much power we have. Los Angeles is starting to talk about $15 an hour, and that is going to be huge because Los Angeles is home to 800,000 workers, low-wage workers, who will get 15. So look at what, look at the impact we're having. I just wanted to say one more thing about the attacks that they will uh, level against us. One of the things they will say is, well, you know, all of us politicians agree with all of this. You know, what has she done? Everything that, everything good that has happened in Seattle has got nine votes. But the point is that there wasn't a single vote before we came on the scene. And now they are afraid to be on the wrong side of history. That is why we are getting nine votes. And, the, and those nine votes are testament to how much impact we can have collectively through a grassroots movement. I also wanted to mention the LGBTQ community. Many of you were there uh, at the forum that we did a week and a half ago. I talked about it the following Monday at the council briefing, you know, that it was wonderful to see 325 people there. And uh, one of the council members said, uh, you know, Rasmussen said something to the effect that, well, this is nothing new, we've done that before, but you know, we tried to build an LGBTQ community center, but the community didn't work well on that. 
And, you know, my response to that is, well, you know, if you're an elected official with so much power, you shouldn't be blaming the community. You should be working with the community to build uh, the organs that will help uh, the LGBTQ community to, uh, to, you know, to be able to uh, be uh, members of the community in, in every right. One important thing I wanted to stress today, you know, everybody's talked about how we need to win in November. That's absolutely correct. But let's not miss this important thing. The real victory we need to have first is in August. That's the first election campaign we're facing. August 5th, I don't know what the date is, August 5th. August 3rd is our first election. Because if we come out with a thunderously positive result in August, then we will be well on our way to winning in November. If we don't, if we have an ambiguous result in August, I can promise you that the establishment has so much emotion and resources devoted to this campaign, they will make every effort to vanquish us. And we have seen this happening over and over again everywhere around the country where well-meaning left campaigns were defeated simply because we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the strategies, we didn't have the tactics. So please let's be clear that while we have morality and truth on our side, this campaign is going to be fought on the streets and they will do everything in their power to defeat us. And one of the principal ways, the principal weapons they will use is to isolate me as a person and try to tear me down, you know, say that she's narcissistic, she's a diva, you know, all kinds of horrible things have been said about me. But we have to keep our, 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 our vision clear. We're not fighting for my campaign, we're fighting for a voice that is finally rising up against this injustice that we see in our society. We're seeing a space opening up for communities of color to fight back against racial injustice. We've seen that with the Black Lives Matter movement. So let's use this campaign as a really phenomenal vehicle to push that voice forward and let's show them on August 3rd what American people, what the people of Seattle are really looking for.